So uh, I quite like this one because it works out how many planets you need where, if everybody lived like me. And I must admit, I didn't do it in 2010. My journey sort of more or less started in 2010. Uh, but I've done it with hindsight. I worked out what I did then. And then I've got compared it with where I am now. Oh. And, and I, uh, in 2010, even though there were two of us living in this house, my husband was still alive, we would have needed 3.3 Earths to continue with our lifestyle at the time. We had a diesel car and our house wasn't well insulated and we had oil central heating and all that sort of thing. And we used to fly to Australia occasionally because my son lived there and then we flew to Germany because my other son lived there. So, and I've managed to whittle it down to 1.2 Earth. It's still more than my fair share, but at least it's, it's a bit better. So that was, that was the, the ecological footprint. And uh, but later in my journey, I'll talk mainly about my carbon footprint rather than my CO2, my ecological footprint. So the first little steps in 2010 were, were my husband was always very keen. He would, he would, we were switching to energy efficient light bulbs and we uh, draft proofed all our house, that, which is actually probably the cheapest and most effective thing you can do with your house to keep yeah. it warm, to just insulate your house better. I know it can be a bit of a pain, but it's very cheap and it's very effective. So that is the cheapest and most effective way. And that's why we started. And as I said, we then replaced all our light bulbs with the then energy efficient ones. And in the meantime, there's a new generation of the LED light bulbs, which are even more energy efficient. They're actually really cheap now. If you go to Screw Fix, you can get a pack of five for £10.49. And the Center for Sustainable Energy estimates that this, this one bulb saves about £150 in electricity bill over its lifetime. And the lifetime is 20 years, but it is, you know, for an investment of £2 to save £150 is probably not bad. And you are saving an awful lot of electricity. Then, then we took a much bigger step at the end of 2010. Uh, our neighbors led the way. They were installing a ground source heat pump. I'd never heard of a ground source heat pump. And I thought, what's this newfangled technology? I had no idea what it was, but I was sufficiently interested in, in looking into it and asked how a heat pump works. And to my surprise, I found out that I already had one in my house a fridge, uh, because that is exactly the same technology. It's basically extracting warmth from a source where it's a very low extra warmth and you concentrate it out. Uh, and in the case of the fridge, the heat is at the back of the fridge and the cool bit is in the middle of the fridge. In the case of a heat pump, it's the other way around. But heat pumps can actually, in hotter climates, can be used in the reverse as well, so that you can use them as, um, as air conditioning as well. So in 2010, as I said, we actually uh, went down the route of, in, uh, of installing a, a, a ground source heat pump. We had an oil boiler before. It, it was much bigger than the old boiler, so we needed a relatively large airing cupboard, which meant that our towels and things had to move out and move into a set of shelves in the bedroom. We obviously required quite a large area of ground and we were lucky enough we've got a field and we just buried them in there. So not everybody is lucky enough to have that, I realize that. But a relatively big garden for most houses is actually adequate. The um, slight disadvantage of heat pumps is that they don't get the water quite as hot as boilers. So the radiators don't get quite as warm. So what we did in the living room, we had three ordinary radiators and we uh, in, uh, swapped one for a size which was about twice the original size. And we had a little blow fan uh, radiator installed on, in the kitchen, but we actually never really used that, that wasn't necessary. But because it was so early in that technology, we went for a local installer, we were his first customers and he went bust within six months. 
So that wasn't it. And you made lots of mistakes as well. So there were quite a lot of teething problems. I was, I have to be honest, it wasn't very easy at the beginning. But of course, that was 11 years ago. So things have changed an awful lot since then. <laughs> but on the positive side, heating our house with oil produces about five tons of CO2. And with electricity, even with ordinary electricity, and in our case, because we installed solar panels later on as well, it's even less. But it's it, with ordinary uh, UK electricity, uh, heat pump produ needs, uh, produces about 1.7 tons of CO2. So that's a big saving. Uh, I'd already talked about the radiators, and we've now discovered a reputable local installer. So I think a lot of those teething problems have all been resolved now. Aaron, can I just ask, is that the air source heat pump inside, or is that the water tank? No, that's, that's, the, that's the heat pump. That is the heat pump. It's not air source. It's, it's, I mean, it's a heat pump, that one. It's the inside, yes. It's in our old airing cupboard. And the, the water tank, you can see the water tank just on the left behind my, uh, my uh, clothes rack. That's, the hot water is in the, in the um, round uh, you know, water container and the heat pump itself is that big white cupboard. And that red uh, container that you see on the right hand side is, the, is a pressure ves vessel for the um, liquid that is in the in the ground loop. It's, um, so it's saline solution with antifreeze, which is buried in the ground. It's a big, I should have taken a picture of the pipe. It's about two inches diameter and it's buried one meter below ground. So this is what we did with our radiator. That's the old radiator there and it's been replaced by that one. It's not even looking any bigger, but it's fatter and it's much more efficient. And we have a little uh, fan on the top which switches itself on when the radiator is hot and then it blows a bit of extra warm air into the living room as well. And we've got that on two radiators. So between those two extra little tweaks, it seems to be perfectly all right. And then we put, we insulated the radiators at the back as well with a sort of reflective silver foil because a lot of um, radiators are on outside walls and quite a lot of heat gets lost to the outside wall. So we, uh, we uh, made sure that all the heat came into the living room and into the other rooms. And then this, these were our next two steps. Uh, in 2010, six months later, we decided that as we had a heat pump, it would be good to produce our own electricity as well. We're lucky enough to have two barns, but I mean, that could have gone on our house as well, but because we had the barns and the barns were perfectly orientated towards the south, we had this first, this is the first system which we installed in 2010. And that was at the time, the sort of maximum size you could have at that tariff. So that was installed in 2010. And then five years later, Sadly, my husband had passed away by then, so it was just me. I installed a second system, which is that one on the second barn and these extra panels here, which you can see there, which is about half as big again as the uh, first one. So altogether, they save about uh, two tons of CO2. So it's not as much as the, the biggest one was heat pump, and I'll show you a graph later where you can compare all my, all my savings. But uh, of course, it means that all my electricity is pretty green. <clears throat> oh, what's, oh, there was an empty one. So this is the sort of financial benefits of all the installations. The heat pump cost, um, I can't actually read, 17,200 pounds in 2010. And compared to oil, my electricity bill, I estimate, is about 300 to 400 pounds less. Uh, but the government very uh, generously at the time offered the renewable heat incentive. And I've had the seven years of just out, they came in three years later after we'd already installed it. And I've now had 16,463 pounds over those seven years. So it's basically paid for the installation. And then the actual costs are savings just by themselves. And the renewable heat pump is still on offer. So just so. 
if you want a heat pump, it's time to put your skates on. Now, other people can't put uh, ground source heat pumps in because they haven't got enough space, but the air source heat pump is obviously cheaper. At the moment, it's roughly between six and a half and 10,000 pounds, depending on the size and its location, etc., and presumably your installer as well. But it's also eligible for the renewable heat incentive, so you'll get quite a bit of money towards the installation costs over seven years as well. It's basically almost pays for itself within seven years. Now the solar panels, in 2010, the initial installation, the feed-in tariff was incredibly generous. The installation cost 14 and a half thousand then, but the uh, feed-in tariff was so high that I earn about, I broke even after about seven years, and now it earns me about 2,000 pounds every year, which is quite ludicrous, really. So not surprisingly, that feed-in uh, the um, feed -in tariff was reduced fairly quickly. The second installation was already much cheaper because the solar panels cost have gone much cheaper. Uh, and But I only earn about £900 per year on that. And I work out that it's about break-even point after nine years. Currently, I've tried to uh, cost it out what it would currently cost and what you would get back and the current four kilowatt peak installation, which is the one that I installed initially, cost between four and a half and six and a half thousand pounds. You can, you don't get the feed-in tariff anymore, but you can sell your surplus energy to a green energy company who pays and the one that has the best tariff at the moment is Octopus which means that you can earn and save about 350 pounds a year. So I worked it out that takes about 12 years to break even. So compared from the initial seven years to nine years to 12 years, it's not as good as it used to be, but it's still, it's still a really good positive step and it does save you money in the long run. Now, the, uh, I was already telling you about this renewable heat incentive, which you get for heat pumps. You can also claim it for biomass boilers and solar water heating. Uh, and that is the link to the um, website where you get all the information about it. But at the moment, the government is planning to face it out next year. So if you are at all thinking about heat pumps, do it now, otherwise it's not going to be as beneficial as it is now. I mean, you'll still save the planet, but you won't save as much money. Now, in September, our dear, go dear government came out with this big announcement, the Green Homes Grant, make energy improvements to your home. And it was meant to run for a year and a half. Uh, and this was in my previous talk because it was still running then. But on the 27th of March, they suddenly made an announcement. It was going to be withdrawn and it was being withdrawn from the 1st of April. So with four days notice. So all this big hoo-ha about how they were supporting green, I hope I've gone down, green installations, uh, I'm sure it was pre-planned that they were going to withdraw it very, very quickly because you could actually get grants of up to 5,000 pounds towards heat pumps and various other installations. But as I said, the government has whipped it away. Now there are still alternatives if you aren't lucky enough to have a roof which is suitable for solar panels. And this is one of my favorite ones, which I've, which I've actually signed up for as well, because I obviously still have to buy some electricity. You can actually pay for a piece of wind turbine in South Wales. It's called Craig Puffer. Uh, it's somewhere near um, uh, Newport, I think. Uh, and if they pay, it, you can buy as much share in it as your annual consumption of electricity is. You have to have a look at your electricity bills and they let you buy as much, 120% of what you're actually estimate you're using. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, you know, to the last penny, but that's, they obviously want small investors. Um, and then over 20 years, you actually, they pay you that money back that you initially paid for the wind turbine because that's the expected life 
life expectancy of the wind turbine. But at the same time, all the earnings from the wind turbines, you, the share that your contribution is made towards those earnings gets taken off your electricity bill. So it's, it, it's basically exactly the same as what would happen with, a, with solar panels on your roof, except it's a wind turbine in South Wales and not solar panels on your roof. You pay up front and then you save on your electricity bill. Uh, and over about, I worked out that after about 10 to 12 years, you break even and then it's pure, pure earning. So it's very, very comparable to what you get with solar panels. Uh, at the moment, the only slight hitch is that not every electricity company has a contract with the uh, people who are organizing the wind turbine. It's only Energy Co-op co Energy and Octopus Energy who are doing it at the moment. So if you are thinking of doing that, you have to switch electricity providers first. But, but um, Octopus is, is quite a good one. They've got quite few innovative tariffs which are designed to save electricity. Okay, I've already accidentally switched to my next slide. So this was my next big step. I, this is actually a, oh, what was that? Oh, the chair has arrived. <laughs> okay, uh, so this was my next big step and it's a, a, my second electric car. I had a, had a leaf initially and then when I wanted to last summer, I wanted to have a car that would actually go as far as Germany. I swapped and I swapped to a Zoe and the Zoe has a range of to about 220 miles. So I could very easily travel to Germany if COVID permitted, but COVID isn't permitting me at the moment. But that was the reason for switching, otherwise I would have kept my other car. So I charge it in summer when the sun shines and in the winter at night on an electric vehicle tariff, which is a, it's the best one on offer at the moment, that's with Octopus. And for four hours, I pay five pence per kilowatt hour, uh, uh, which is plenty for you know all, any of the driving that I need. But of course, at the moment, with all my solar panels, I'm plugging it in when the sun shines. So I'm driving on sunshine at the moment. I worked out over the five years when I had the leaf that I saved about six and a half thousand pounds in various ways. That's because you don't pay road tax. And of course, you, electricity is an awful lot cheaper than uh, diesel. Uh, and also there's the um, maintenance is much cheaper because a lot fewer things going wrong in electric cars. So it's an overall saving, saving of over a thousand pounds a year. So the extra cost of a small electric car like that are very quickly made up. And if you want to, if you're still nervous about electric cars, but would be really happy to try one out. There's a really good scheme supported by the West of England local authorities, including North Somerset. And you, it's called Go Ultra Low West. I've put the uh, link at the bottom. And you, for, you can actually try an electric car out for free for two weeks. They bring it to your house you, and they pick it up again. You obviously have to uh, you make sure you, that you're insured. They, they do some checks on you to make sure you're not going to abscond and that you're a safe driver and that you're insured. But you can basically borrow an electric car for two weeks and all you have to do is pay for the electricity it uses by yeah, usually you can just use a three pin plug. Uh, you know, you don't need the special charging points. You can charge most cars by just plugging it into your normal electricity supply as long as you've got a, a, tra a lead that uh, reaches far enough. Uh, the, mo the ones they have most often are the Leafs and the Zoes. That, those were the ones they used to. I'm not sure whether they've got other ones now. <laughs> And then people worry about car charging. And these are the two arrangements I've got. I've got an ordinary three pin plug. And if the sun is shining, but it's not very strong, then I charge uh, on, with a three pin plug, which charges at about two kilowatt hours, which sort of keeps, keeps pace with the production of the solar panels. Uh, at night or when it's really nice sunshine, I can use my fast charger, which is the one on the right. And that charges at about three and a half kilowatt hours per uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, and uh, so 
if you work out how many miles that gives you on the slow charge, eight hours give me about 75 miles and on the fast charge, eight hours give me 120 miles. And the actual cost uh, is less than two pence a mile. Uh, the petrol and diesel costs at least five times as much for a car, so it's a really big saving. And the government again gives grants towards installing the fast charging system and most people go down that route because if you're in a bit of a hurry and you want to put a bit more juice in quite quickly, it's obviously more practical to have a slightly a system that charges a bit faster and you can get up to three and a half thousand, 350 pounds, sorry, towards, towards installing it. And it usually costs about seven or 800 pounds to install one. Um, and that was another big step. It was a bit of an experiment because battery storage had only just come in. In 2017, I installed this battery storage system. It, it says it's, a, it's got a capacity of five kilowatt hours, but of course it only, never empties completely. It stops at 20%. So effectively it stores four kilowatt hours, even though it says it stores five. It has meant that I could up my use from solar PV from 40% to 65%. And that is with me being quite vigilant, turning things on when the sun is shining, etc., etc. The thing is, it never, the, the things you use and your production never synchronize completely, obviously. You get a cloud coming over or you want to cook when it's dark or uh, the, the, the uh, battery can only charge at one kilowatt hour uh, as well. So, you know, when the solar panels produce a lot more, then you still can't put it into your batteries. So all in all, I wasn't, I must admit, I wasn't terribly impressed with the battery savings. And, oh, and <laughs> to crown it all, I worked out that when I compare what I store and what I draw out again, I lose about 30%. So uh, battery storage at the moment is still not terribly good. I think it's better now and the Tesla power wall is better than this one. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would like to have somebody else's experience and see if it's, it's better. It cost me 4,200 4, pounds and I save about 140 pounds a year. Right, and then... <laughs> Then after all my exciting bits, I had a bit of a disaster in my house. And if you look, there's a big black hole in my roof next to the chimney. I had a fire in my, that was the culprit there, my open fireplace. It wasn't a chimney fire. It was a log which was so tinder dry that it burned so brightly and so hot that my metal chimney got too hot and, and the rafters next to it started smoldering and burst into flames. Uh, so yeah, that was another fire and that's what my poor roof looked like. I was incredibly lucky because this is what it looked like on the inside. The insulation panels at the top actually had a slight crack there and that was it. Apart from that, I had no damage indoors. But what it did do, it highlighted a few issues with my house, which I hadn't been aware of. So in some ways, it turned out to be a bit of a blessing in disguise. I got, I installed a much better <laughs> log burner, which is much more efficient than the previous one. Of course, it's much cleaner and it's much safer as well. I note, oh, no, hang on a minute. I, well, I noticed that the insulation layer in my roof was actually only about three inches. So when that was all repaired, I made sure I got an extra layer of another four inches on top. So my house is much better insulated now. Uh, and I've got a much better chimney, which is better insulated as well. So I don't actually have a draft down my chimney anymore. So in some ways it was actually, like I said, a blessing in disguise, but it was a very heavy disguise because at the time, as you can imagine, it was, Pretty stressful. Okay, now I also made some other changes to my lifestyle. Uh, as I was already saying, we used to fly to Australia when my son lived in Australia once a year for five years. Uh, I, 
uh, obviously I have a lot of family in Germany, so we used to fly to Germany as well. But instead of that now, uh, and that I must admit is a very recent, <laughs> recent event. I mean, I don't have to fly to Australia anymore because my son moved back to Europe quite a long time ago, but obviously my family still lives in Germany. So, but I don't fly anymore. I take the Eurostar instead of flying or I drive, want to drive my electric car. I've turned my thermostat down by one degree and set the timer better only when I need warmth. I wear a jumper. I buy less stuff. I must admit I was already fairly mean and didn't buy an awful lot of stuff. But if you look, I, I have a little graph later on which shows you how much difference stuff makes in our life. I monitor my consumption with a smart meter. Also, also I monitor it with an app which is uh, provided by Western Power Distribution. I'll show you an example in a minute because there are certain times on the, in the day when the electricity is much greener than at other times and you can check it on the app. I eat much less meat. I used to be quite a, quite a good meat eater, but I just eat meat as a treat now. I'm still not a vegetarian, but I only eat locally sourced organic meat and maybe once every two weeks or so, possibly less. I eat a lot more local produce and I share my garden. That is what I've definitely dropped. And uh, just to give you an example of how much CO2 flights produce, a flight to Sydney is five tons of CO2. One to Munich is a third of a ton, to Tenerife is nearly a ton. So it's a massive contribution to, if you do that, to your carbon footprint. This is the app that I was telling you about from Western Power Distribution. It's called Carbon Tracer. And it shows you how many grams of CO2 are produced instantaneously. You have to put your postcode in and it tells you how much in your local area, the electricity, how green it is. And as you can see, 169 grams per kilowatt hour is deemed to be quite green. So it says green for energy and it says switch on your whatever big <laughs> electricity consumer you have. Uh, or, and if it shows red then you wait until it shows green again and you can look at the forecast and you can look at the history as well this is the daily the sort of daily pattern that you have and you can see here during the early hours this is uh, midnight here so during the early hours mostly the electricity is pretty green that's why it's actually good to switch to your energy consumption if during the night and then here in this case during the middle of the day it's very green that was obviously a sunny day. Uh, and then in the afternoon, as people come home and turn all their appliances on, it's not quite so green. And then in the evening, it's better again. So you can, you can look at uh, you know, the hourly rate and there's the various pages where you can display it. But it's quite interesting. It gives you quite a feel about how, how much fluctuation there is in the carbon footprint of the electricity we use. Now, this is my own, <laughs> I'm a bit of a nerd, my own uh, record of my electricity consumption and production, starting from 2010. And I, stopped, I, I prepared this talk uh, last, the end of last year, so I haven't got it quite to, to the current day. But you can see the black line is my total consumption of electricity. And you can see that I've managed to cut that down quite a long way. And that is the total consumption, including what I consume from my solar panels. So the, the reduction is genuinely behavioral change, probably also a change in the uh, cold winters, but the last winter was quite cold and that was still quite a fairly good consumption. So, uh, and the, the green lines are my solar panels. You can see the, how they go up. That was the first installation. The Dutch one is the green one. The solid green line is my second solar installation. Unfortunately, you can see that when my peak consumption is in the winter, my solar production is at the bottom. So solar panels and heat pumps don't marry very well together. They are fairly out of sync. Uh, electric cars and solar panels are much better, oh, I've got my, uh, are much better suited they, they uh, fit much better together. I mean, it, it still saves quite a lot of electricity, but uh, you know, not directly. 
more indirectly by me exporting it to the brain. <clears throat> okay, then some other other uh, uh, things that, that I did, like uh, yes, be all to do with behavior and and uh, sort of put my money where my mouth is. I switched energy supplier to what I thought was one of the greenest. I originally went to um, ecotricity and good energy, but I recently gone to Octopus because they actually have some very innovative tariffs which try and flatten our, our electricity consumption, which I think is actually very important as well. And they have a very good tariff for electric cars. I switched banks. I'm currently with Triodos, uh, but I, I'm aware that there will be an Avon um, co-op uh, bank as well. Uh, um, so there will be, a, it's not quite up and running yet, but it's, it is coming, coming along. So that would be a local bank with green credentials. I lobbied my pension provider to divest uh, and I invested in various local green pro uh, projects like Low Carbon Gordano, Bristol Energy Company, and then there are some other funds nationally, ESEX and Abund Abundance. And there was a little local startup, which I thought was very worth supporting. And that is a, a young chap who gave us actually a talk a little while ago, and he produces biochar out of ash dieback. Uh, and uh, biochar is a very good soil improver and of course it stores carbon because it's not meant to be burned, it's meant to be added to the soil. So it stores carbon in the soil. So that was, uh, that was quite a good enterprise, I thought. Now, I just I plotted this just to give you an idea how much of an impact these various steps had. And you can see it, there are quite big differences. The blue column is always the 2010 column, and the red column is the improved column for 2020. And you can see that by far, by far, the biggest impact was me switching to the heat pump. The electricity consumption that I've shown here is assuming I use electricity from the national grid and not my own green energy. If I sort of subtract that, it's probably about here. And similarly for my car, that is assuming I charge the car with grid electricity and not from the solar panels, because clearly when I charge them from the solar panels, it's almost down there. So that was a big, so these two were obviously my two biggest steps. The, this is just the remaining electricity switching to solar, to a green provider, but also, you know, using some of my own electricity. So that's fairly minor. The food going from a bit not, you know, average type food to an almost vegetarian food is quite a big step but if I became vegan it would probably be about there so that's not quite as good and this is my travel habits flight versus train so that's quite a good step as well now the, this was my own behavior on the left and I just put other behaviors just for comparison to see the size of it now this massive column is if you use a lot of stuff Lots of furniture, a lot of clothes, a lot of big, you know, stuff, basically. So that is an absolute massive imprint on our carbon footprint. Most people aren't aware of it. I certainly wasn't. And if you go to charity shops and you wear things until they wear out and you repair things, you can reduce that absolutely massive, massively. Now, the thing most people are quite proud of is, if they, is their waste and recycling. But unfortunately, recycling, although it obviously has the really good benefits of not polluting our planet with all that plastic, in terms of carbon footprint, the imprint is fairly minimal. It's this little, little difference here. So in terms of CO2, recycling doesn't have much of an impact. It clearly has a big impact on the environment in other ways. I uh, just wanted to show you what other people have done. This is a friend of ours, uh, also lives in Winscombe, uh, also a Green Party member. And he in they installed this wood pellet boiler. 
uh, it provides central heating, hot water and cooking. Uh, it was, in it, it was it's still eligible for renewable heat incentive, but of course, as I told you, the green home grants, which was there for six months, has now been taken away again. So you can't install a wood pellet boiler anymore and get 5,000 pounds towards it. Uh, this is an air source heat pump, and again, it's a friend of ours who uh, lives in Winscombe, and she's got her air source heat pump up on the on the roof above her, <laughs> an extension to her house, so it's not in the back garden. That's what it looks like on the outside, and that's the uh, hot water boiler in on the inside where it stores the hot water for central heating and hot water. And again, the Green Homes Grant, you could use that towards it, it's gone. Renewable heat incentive is still there. Now there, there's this other clever option, which I think is not well known at all. And that is you can actually upgrade an existing boiler by adding a small heat pump to it. Um, it the government was actually giving you money towards it for, um, oil boilers, but as far as I know, you can actually bolt it onto a gas boiler as well. And you add a small, relatively cheap uh, air source heat pump outside your house. It's got very uh, smart controls and it switches over to whichever is optimum. And if it's, so if it's a very cold day, it switches over to your original boiler. And if it's a mild day or electricity is particularly cheap or green, then it switches to your air source heat pump. Um, it called, the installation itself cost, when I, when I last checked it, I, and I'm not totally sure whether that's still up to date, only 1,620 pounds. And then you pay 10 pounds per month for seven years. It's called a bee snug. It is actually now owned by Shell, I think. So they've obviously realized there's money to be made in, with renewables as well. So I, I, it's, initially it was its own little company, but Shell have bought it up now. Uh, but it's, you know, it seems a really good way of utilizing your old boiler, but uh, switching over to a, to a heat pump at the same time. A uh, good source of information is the Energy Saving Trust. I'm sure you've uh, all come across that. And it uh, it's gives you lots and lots of information. You can also ring them up and ask for their advice. It's a social enterprise and, uh, you know, non-profit organization. And that's where I got an awful lot of my initial information from when I was thinking about solar panels and heat pumps. Now, little tiny steps, <laughs> which are sort of bolted on at the end. These are bamboo socks, bamboo toilet paper, and that's the bamboo plant. <laughs> so you can, you can still do little things to tweak your carbon footprint. And the carb, bamboo toilet paper is, I find, actually very, very good. And the, and the uh, bamboo clothing is very soft and comfortable and it hasn't got the huge water need and chemical need that uh, cotton has. So this is my journey, just to show you uh, where I started again, to remind you initially 3.3 Earths and now 1.2 Earths. I realized you know, that my biggest saving was probably the heat pump and not everybody can put a ground source heat pump in, but most people can put an air source heat pump in and I still think that's a, a really, good thing to do. Uh, just a, a little extra bit of information to just ch show you what your lifestyle choices, the impact uh, they have. And again, as I already showed you before, reducing your stuff from <laughs> can go down from five tons to less than two tons if you're very, very careful with how much stuff you use in your life. Change from vegetarian, from ordinary to vegan. You can see that is a big step, much bigger than mine. So I could still go quite a bit further with that. The green electricity tariff, just the tariff itself, for no other methods, is a small saving. And this is the recycling saving. So it puts it into perspective. Stuff is the biggest and your diet. And the other thing I found out is that even if you make, you decide to make such changes yourself, 
it is like throwing a pebble in a pond because you chat to other people about it and they copy you. And I'm pleased to say that at least three people in my family installed solar panels after I did it. And another four people I know have now got electric cars, which they sort of, uh, I, you might remember we had a, a green, a electric car uh, exhibition day once a couple of years ago before COVID struck. Uh, but just chatting to people it is that first step is not just your own step. You do actually influence other people with it as well. So I think that's the end of my presentation. Click exit. So thank you very much. Take that off. Thank you, Karen. That was great. Okay. Very well done. Okay. <laughs> I've covered lots of different things there. Yes, I mean, the, the links to the various information websites are on the presentation, so I could always share it. I can't actually see my, where is my Zoom thing at the moment? I can't actually If anyone's see uh, got any questions, you can uh, unmute yourselves and uh, have a chat. Hi, Johnny. Uh, ha uh, hello, David. I have a million questions. Well, actually, no. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Karen. That, uh, that, was, that was really, really good. Thank and you. Please take this as positive uh, and not pointing fingers or sticking pins or whatever the negative is. But throughout, I couldn't help but go, hang on a minute. And I'm going to have to read off my little notes to say it so I don't actually go off on too much of a tangent. So, the investment itself, and I'm not getting at you. I love you for the investment, but the investment itself, to me, it's smart. It's like stocks and shares, and forgive my language, but that's for the twats that can afford it. And I've I know. pulled that down. <laughs> I know. Um, and and I, 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 I recoiled when you said, oh, not everybody can afford blah, blah, blah. But most people can uh, can can uh, put a, a, a uh, I've written it badly uh, something source heat pump in, and I went actually no, most people live in houses of multiple occupancy, and they can't they don't have the choice to put these things in. And I'm not getting it, Karen. I'm getting at the world and social I, structure. I'm well aware of that, Johnny. I have I'm lucky enough to be able to do it. But you yes. can craft proof your, your windows and you can put foil behind radiators and you yeah. can use bamboo toilet paper. Uh, Ooh, let, uh, hang on, let me stop you on that one. I'm, I'm so with you, Karen, I'm so with you. But bamboo toilet paper, that's another of my questions. So let's get it now. Um, so I did quite a lot of research on, on, on the best toilet paper to use. And most bamboo toilet paper is imported from Japan, China, and comes a long, long way by ship. Uh, and the cost of that is ridiculous. There is a company whose name just went out of my head, but I use them all the time, Ecoleaf. I had to turn around and have a look, who are UK based. They use 100% recycled paper. And I, 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 unfortunately, I haven't done the graphs like you, but I have researched it massively. Yeah. We in the UK are better off supporting them than importing bamboo toilet paper. Okay. The, the likes right. of who gives a crap are crap. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so, and uh, I, 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 please, I'm not getting you. I love this, and and I love what you're doing, and it's amazing. So please let please everyone know that I really support what Karen is doing, and, and it's brilliant. Uh, octopus, how green are they? I'm with Ecotricity because I love Dale, what's his name? And They are not as green in terms of uh, in st putting much mu an awful lot of money into wind turbines, uh, but they have come up with some very innovative um, tariffs which uh, encourage you to use electricity when it's greener and cheaper. So it, it, it becomes, the, the, what you pay for it follows the the, the price which basically follows the carbon footprint as well 
So if you can switch away from the four hours in the afternoon, four o'clock to eight o'clock, it's called Octopus Agile, uh, then you, it becomes, you save money and you save carbon footprint. It, but you don't install solar panels and wind turbines. They do install some wind turbines, but they don't do as many. It's probably it's a different way of of. Um, but we need to flat, uh, flatten the curve of our electricity consumption as well, and that's where octopus are very good at uh, in having tariffs which encourage that sort of behaviour. So I'm still with good energy for my house for my heat pump. They're very good as well. The best ones in terms of installing um, renewable energy is, is ecotricity and good energy, in my opinion. But octopus is a close, close third. And because of my ability to choose my electricity tariff, so it uses electricity when it's really green, I've gone to octopus for the, for the uh, barns. And I, and I so appreciate and I like that. that. I like that wind turbine idea as well, that you can actually invest a little bit in a wind turbine. And it's, I just like their approach to being innovative. So, yeah. yeah. I, I have to agree with you that, that invest a little bit in the wind turbine is awesome for those who can't afford to do something yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is just Green Party rhetoric, if you like, because... The fact that we have to uh, choosing your hours when you do your when it's best to pull your electricity, invest your power and stuff. It's I don't know. It's like it's like some Netflix film, Dagenham and Girls from Essex type stuff, which which is amazing and a true story. But this it shouldn't be. Uh, we we should all be simply focused, uh, simply presented with something that says. This is how it is, and this is how easy it is. Not this is a quagmire that you've got to go through ditches and corridors to find your way through. That in itself needs changing. And I'm not getting anyone except for the government and the world. <laughs> David. Yeah, I, I mean, Johnny, you know, really good point about a lot of the things you know, a lot of people can't afford or, or can't install. You know, they can't have electric cars, they can't have air source heat pumps because of the, the sort of uh, buildings they're in or whatever, um, or haven't got a driveway. And, and I think that's why we're so frustrated with the Conservative government taking away the, the sort of Green Deal and the, the Green Energy Deal and you know, talking about taking the RIHA away. Now, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people who have got the money jump on those schemes and benefit from them. Um, yep. Stocks and shares. And if, you know, if there was a way of making sure that money was being used you know, for the people that need it and the, the difficult properties and the people in fuel poverty, you know, that would be fantastic. Um, Retrofitting and insulation would be by far the best way of spending government money. Well, yeah. that, but that was a condition, wasn't it, Karen? That you couldn't get yeah. the five thousand pounds for the heat pump unless you've done the you have insulation. To install insulation. Yeah, it you wasn't. To, I mean, yeah, you it was. Go quite through the good. steps. Uh, yeah. which can I can I thing. add a little bit on that? I can't remember when it was. I don't know five years ago plus, when the government was pushing insulating your new home, insulating retro insulating your home. Yeah. I got suckered, and I use the word carefully, yeah. suckered into the team uh, of people that were going round round houses, knocking on doors, trying to trying to get yeah. people to do this. Oh my God, what a hard a lot of hard work for nothing, and yeah. that's how our government is spending money on. Yeah. They are a shower of shit. It, so it was a complete fiasco. Yeah. 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 But again, yeah. You know, if if you put a scheme in that's only going to run for a year or 18 months you're not giving the reputable installers time to train people up to really yeah. do it properly learn mm -hmm. you know and and that's what's so ridiculous you know that we, yeah. we need it's just a five, 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 ten year you know yeah. it has to be a committed scheme for say 10 yeah. years or something yeah. um because the industry got really burnt um, with solar panels. All the small installers got really got their fingers yeah. burnt, didn't they? Yeah. 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 And, and it's still so confusing. And one of my other questions, 
or statements, really, because I'm not really asking questions, so I'm just ranting, it is greener energy at different times of the day. And uh, get up at four o'clock and turn your panel on. Fuck off, you oh, pricks. No, no you, you get a little time switch, Johnny. <laughs> you don't have to get out of bed. I've just got one of those little time switches that switches it on by my dishwasher. Occasionally, when I use a dishwasher, switches it on at night. <laughs> All right. I, but John, I, I guess Johnny, it, what, it is, John, yeah. you know, as soon as... You, with having your own solar panels on, you just start doing it because you think, right, we're getting power. What well, you know, let's put some washing on. You don't yeah. do extra washing, but I, I, I'm you, with you, you make I'm sure with you, you do but, it. But no, the government and the powers who be, and, and, and I sound like some conspiracy theorist as I say this, but that's not the system that should be. We should just be able to plug into the network. It should be timed. That's down. That's down to profit. Johnny, but what if, we, if you, we have to can, do what we can do personally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Just, I, I, and, and uh, you know, I mean, that is very personal to each one of us. I've just tried to give you a story of what I've managed to do and, and hope, hoping that something was useful out of that. It was, the, it was wonderful. Equally, you know, the, if you do it with pricing, and people have got a real incentive to use power at different times. Then it's up to them if they wish to or not. But with the smart, you know, um, equipment, the switching and that makes it a, a lot, lot easier to do some of this stuff, which you couldn't do three or four years ago. Um, so, you know, that's being developed as well. The smart, the smart switching, and that. So there are opportunities there without you having to get up at four o'clock and do it yourself. I was exaggerating, and I'm really sorry, and I agree with everything you're saying, Karen and David. But what I'm aiming at, what I'm what I'm gauging this by, are the less informed, the less engaged people in our society, and they are the majority. Yeah. And that's where this is where, where it all falls down. And I really appreciate what you're doing, Karen, and giving us the opportunity to do those things because we are the privileged few. But it's a non-privilege, and this is the problem. So I sorry, I'm, not that, you. I'm getting to the world. Yeah, we we totally agree with you, Johnny. There's no, absolutely. But you know, you can only do what you can do, can't you? Yeah. 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 Where's my machete and machine gun? <laughs> That's not uh, going to Joe, Joe, I've noticed you've come off mute. Do you want to? ask a question or say anything um question um yes a, a th first of all <laughs> apologies for coming in very late um and i had quite a lot to do when i got home which is why i was uh muted and invisible but um you know, nobody wants to watch someone eating over zoom and <laughs> sorting out the cat and things like that um i thought um your talk karen and um, was was very interesting and extremely well illustrated um and it is the example of, as you've just been saying, all three of you have just been saying, of what the privileged mega consumer can do in order to make things much better. And one of the points I would guess about the majority of people living in shared accommodation that they quite possibly don't own, and many in most cases don't own, is that their carbon footprint may quite well not be as big in the first place. They don't have they, they could look at all Karen's um, different methods of um, reducing their carbon production and pick the ones appropriate to them, and they wouldn't be they wouldn't be coming down from such a high in the first place. One of the difficulties, I guess, we have to make is that if you were, for instance, just to put out all those different ways um, that you, Karen, have saved a lot of uh, carbon dioxide as, as your footprint, is it is you you would not want it to um, give the wrong message out that the only people who can and should be doing this are the people who are already very well off and therefore producing an awful lot. And, you know, you, you could just make people jealous, um, green in the wrong sense. Um, <clears throat> so one would want to be very careful about that. Surely it's better for um, a few affluent people to get um the savings and 
hidden carbon than for nobody to get it. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, they, I, I mean, it's the affluent people who have the biggest carbon footprint to begin with as well, like, like yeah. Joe was just saying. So, yeah. yes, I mean, you know, as you can see, especially the, the staff column, if you remember the size of that, and that is basically buying new furniture, throwing out a perfectly good fitted kitchen if you buy a new house, things like that, which uh, have an incredibly big carbon um, footprint. And uh, those are the upper and flying once or twice or three times on, on holiday. You know, we all know that the majority of flights are taken by a very small proportion of affluent people. So it is the affluent people. And to, for them to buy this sort of message, you have to, I think, show them that they can have a very comfortable lifestyle and save money at the same time. That's why I kept trying to say, you know, this is actually not just good for the planet, it's good for your comfort and it's good for your purse as well. That's, that's the way to sell it. It's oh, clearly, it wasn't my priority, obviously, but it can be a priority. And in the end, I don't care what other people's priorities is, as long as they do it. <laughs> yep. Uh, and also, hopefully, you know, as three, four, five years time, there'll be more secondhand electric cars available. Um, yeah. Cheap, or oh, Karen's already on, on her second one. So, um, you know. And, Who got our first one? <laughs> well, the, the, the oh, you know, the five, six-year-old ones are just the same price as any other five, six-year-old car. They're no more expensive now, and, and so uh, you know, and uh, you don't have to have a big car. You buy a little electric car, which is yeah. Uh, yeah. And once you know the volume on air source heat pumps kicks in, if if we can buy, if they can make enough of them, which seems to be a problem, um, yes. and yeah. yeah, the the price will come down, but it. It's like everything, you need the people to start to kick it off. Um, yeah, but I mean, but this pre-slug system seems to be a really good idea to me because mm -hmm. it's a very, you know, the actual insulation cost is £1,600, so it isn't a huge amount of money. Uh, and then you save quite a lot of, um, you know, you, you pay £10 a month for seven years, I think. So you save that over that time as well. So it doesn't actually cost you anything extra, but you reduce your carbon footprint considerably. So maybe as a Green Party, we could, we could push uh, something that actually pays that £1,600 for those who can't afford that, because everyone can pay £10 a month. Because it's the families that can't afford £1,600 that actually need to be investing in this. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, the, the, by far the most important is the retrofitting and the insulation. That's where every yeah. house should start. Yeah. The heat pumps yeah. are yeah. an optional extra to bolt on after you've done. And that is not terribly expensive. But a lot of people just find it inconvenient, like insulating the attic, because there's lots of stuff up there and they don't, can't be bothered to take it out and put the insulation in. Yeah. <laughs> The other yeah. thing I, I would say is if, if you ever have any builders or workmen in, especially in the loft, go in afterwards and make sure they put the insulation back because they just rip it all out. And, you know, you've, you've done a fantastic job. You've got it all in there. And as soon as any tradesman comes in, they just don't bother. That's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 That was a nice tune. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Are there any, okay. more, any more questions for Karen? I've got a couple. But any more? A rant or a question, Johnny? <laughs> um, I, I was really interested in what you said about sharing your garden. I'd love to hear mm. more about that. Yeah. Well, my my husband, bless his cotton socks, was a very keen gardener, and he he made this enormous vegetable garden and uh, it's obviously far too big for me now so I've basically given half of it to some local people who come and use it as their allotment and, and I think there's an awful lot of big houses are probably in similar situations especially yeah. elderly people mm -hmm. and they can give a piece and then you know we basically share the, some of the produce and but the rent is that they have to trim the, trim the borders occasionally and that, that's the rent so 
but you know sharing gardens i think to actually and i think there are schemes in various towns as well i'm sure you know david where uh, you know that where you can uh, put your name down and and ask for people to share their garden with you and it's it's sort of supervised to make sure that it's not abused so there are there are schemes like that but i mean mine is just a, a, you know a friend of a friend basically uh, but you can do it on a much more formal basis as well. And wouldn't it be great if our world existed on an informal basis where we didn't have to put things through organisations and yeah. um, councils? Yeah. So I think that's brilliant. My, possibly my last question is the Avon Co-op Bank. Is this the same as the Cooperative Bank or is it a totally different thing? Even mutual, it's called. It's a new oh. one. It's a totally new one. It's. Uh, it, I got an email from them the other day. I can't remember how I found out about them. It's not up and running yet, but it's being established at the moment. It's called Even Mutual. Do a search for them. I haven't sure. got the. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I think I've actually got an email that I could put on Slack, so I can I can give you the uh, yeah I, I'll put it on the news on Slack. And you can read it up. I, I might catch up with it in a year. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Okay. Come on, guys. I have to make another one up. <laughs> <laughs> if we, if we, uh, we close it there.